The Lord's Prayer, also called the Our Father Latin, Pater Noster, is a venerated Christian prayer which, according to the New Testament, Jesus taught as the way to pray. Pray then in this way. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 NRSV When you pray, say. Luke chapter 11 verse 2 NRSV Two versions of this prayer are recorded in the Gospels, a longer form within the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, and a shorter form in the Gospel of Luke when one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Luke chapter 11 verse 1 NRSV Lutheran theologian Harold Bulls suggested that both were original, the Matthian version spoken by Jesus early in his ministry in Galilee, and the Lucan version one year later, very likely in Judea. The first three of the seven petitions in Matthew address God, the other four are related to human needs and concerns. The Matthew account alone includes the, your will be done, and the, rescue us from the evil one, or, deliver us from evil. Petitions. Both original Greek texts contain the adjective epiousios, which does not appear in any other classical or coin Greek literature, while controversial, daily, has been the most common English language translation of this word. Protestants usually conclude the prayer with a doxology, a later addendum appearing in some manuscripts of Matthew. Initial words on the topic from the Catechism of the Catholic Church teach that it is truly the summary of the whole Gospel. The prayer is used by most Christian churches in their worship, with few exceptions, the liturgical form is the Matthean. Although theological differences and various modes of worship divide Christians, according to Fuller Seminary professor Clayton Schmidt, there is a sense of solidarity in knowing that Christians around the globe are praying together, and these words always unite us. In biblical criticism, the prayer's absence in the Gospel of Mark together with its occurrence in Matthew and Luke has caused scholars who accept the two-source hypothesis against other document hypotheses to conclude that it is probably a Logian original to Q. Topic. Text Topic. Original Greek text and Syriac and Latin translations Topic. Liturgical texts Greek, Syriac, Latin Topic. English versions There are several different English translations of the Lord's Prayer from Greek or Latin, beginning around AD 650 with the Northumbrian translation. Of those in current liturgical use, the three best known are the translation in the 1662 Anglican Book of Common Prayer BCP, of the Church of England, the slightly modernized form used in the 1928 version of the Prayer Book of the Episcopal Church in the United States of America, sometimes with the doxology, corresponding to the version in use among English-speaking Catholics from an earlier date, always without the doxology. The 1988 translation of the Ecumenical English Language Liturgical Consultation ELLC, the square brackets in three of the texts below indicate the doxology often added at the end of the prayer by Protestants and, in a slightly different form, by the Byzantine rite. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Among whom the prayer proper is usually recited by the cantors and congregation in unison, and the doxology by the priest as the conclusion of the prayer. The Anglican Book of Common Prayer adds it in some services but not in all. Older English translations of the Bible, based on late Byzantine Greek manuscripts, included it, but it is excluded in critical editions of the New Testament, such as that of the United Bible Societies. It is absent in the oldest manuscripts and is not considered to be part of the original text of Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13. 
The Catholic Church has never attached it to the Lord's Prayer, but has included it in the Roman Rite Mass as revised in 1969, not as part of the Our Father but separated from it by a prayer called the Embolism spoken or sung by the priest in the official ICEL English translation. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that, by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. That elaborates on the final petition, Deliver us from evil. For more information on this doxology, see Doxology, below. When reformers set out to translate the King James Bible, they assumed that a Greek manuscript they possessed was ancient and therefore adopted the phrase, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Into the Lord's Prayer. Later scholarship demonstrated that the manuscript was actually a late edition based on Eastern liturgical tradition. Other English translations are also used. Though Matthew chapter 6 verse 12 uses the term debts, the older English versions of the Lord's Prayer uses the term trespasses, while ecumenical versions often use the term sins. The latter choice may be due to Luke chapter 11 verse 4, which uses the word sins, while the former may be due to Matthew chapter 6 verse 14 immediately after the text of the prayer, where Jesus speaks of trespasses. As early as the 3rd century, Oregon of Alexandria used the word trespasses paraptimata in the prayer. Although the Latin form that was traditionally used in Western Europe has debitor debts, most English-speaking Christians except Scottish Presbyterians and some others of the Reformed tradition use trespasses. The Presbyterian Church USA, the established Presbyterian Church of Scotland as well as the congregational denomination follow the version found in Matthew chapter 6 in the authorized version known also as the King James Version, which in the prayer uses the words debts and debtors. All these versions are based on the text in Matthew, rather than Luke, of the prayer given by Jesus. Topic. Analysis Subheadings use 1662 Book of Common Prayer BCP see above. Topic. Introduction Our Father, which art in heaven, Ah indicates that the prayer is that of a group of people who consider themselves children of God and who call God the Father in heaven, indicates that the Father who is addressed is distinct from human fathers on earth, Augustine interpreted heaven, colum, sky, in this context as meaning in the hearts of the righteous, as it were in his holy temple. Topic. First petition. Hallowed be thy name. Former Archbishop of Canterbury Rowan Williams explains this phrase as a petition that people may look upon God's name as holy, as something that inspires awe and reverence, and that they may not trivialize it by making God a tool for their purposes, to put other people down, or as a sort of magic to make themselves feel safe. He sums up the meaning of the phrase by saying, understand what you're talking about when you're talking about God, this is serious, this is the most wonderful and frightening reality that we could imagine, more wonderful and frightening than we can imagine. Topic. Second petition. Thy kingdom come. This petition has its parallel in the Jewish prayer, may he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days. In the Gospels Jesus speaks frequently of God's kingdom, but never defines the concept. He assumed this was a concept so familiar that it did not require definition. Concerning how Jesus's audience in the Gospels would have understood him, G.E. Ladd turns to the concept's Hebrew biblical background. The Hebrew word Malkuth refers first to a reign, dominion, or rule and only secondarily to the realm over which a reign is exercised. 
When Malkuth is used of God, it almost always refers to his authority or to his rule as the heavenly king. This petition looks to the perfect establishment of God's rule in the world in the future, an act of God resulting in the eschatological order of the new age. The request for God's kingdom to come is commonly interpreted at the most literal level, as a reference to the belief, common at the time, that a Messiah figure would bring about a kingdom of God. Traditionally, the coming of God's kingdom is seen as a divine gift to be prayed for, not a human achievement. This idea is frequently challenged by groups who believe that the kingdom will come by the hands of those faithful who work for a better world. These believe that Jesus's commands to feed the hungry and clothe the needy are the kingdom to which he was referring. Hilda C. Grafe notes that the operative Greek word, basileia, means both kingdom and kingship, i.e., reign, dominion, governing, etc., but that the English word kingdom loses this double meaning. Kingship adds a psychological meaning to the petition, one is also praying for the condition of soul where one follows God's will. Topic. Third petition Thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. According to William Barclay, this phrase is a couplet with the same meaning as, Thy kingdom come. Barclay argues, the kingdom is a state of things on earth in which God's will is as perfectly done as it is in heaven. To do the will of God and to be in the kingdom of God are one and the same thing. John Ortberg interprets this phrase as follows. Many people think our job is to get my afterlife destination taken care of, then tread water till we all get ejected and God comes back and tortures this place. But Jesus never told anybody, neither his disciples nor us, to pray, get me out of here so I can go up there. His prayer was, make up there come down here, make things down here run the way they do up there. The request that, thy will be done, is God's invitation to, join him in making things down here the way they are up there. Topic. Fourth petition. Give us this day our daily epiusios bread. As mentioned earlier in this article, the original word epiusios, epiusios, commonly characterized as daily, is unique to the Lord's Prayer in all of ancient Greek literature. The word is almost a hapax legomenon, occurring only in Luke and Matthew's versions of the Lord's Prayer, and nowhere else in any other extant Greek texts. While epiusios is often substituted by the word daily, all other New Testament translations from the Greek into daily, otherwise reference hemeron, hemeron, the day, which does not appear in this usage, via linguistic parsing, Jerome translated epishon, epiusios, as supersubstantialum, in the Gospel of Matthew, but chose quotidianum, daily, in the Gospel of Luke. This wide-ranging difference with respect to meaning of epiusios is discussed in detail in the current Catechism of the Catholic Church by way of an inclusive approach toward tradition as well as a literal one for meaning. Taken in a temporal sense, this word is a pedagogical repetition of this day, to confirm us in trust, without reservation. Taken in the qualitative sense, it signifies what is necessary for life, and more broadly every good thing sufficient for subsistence. Taken literally epiusios. Super essential. It refers directly to the bread of life, the body of Christ, the medicine of immortality, without which we have no life within us. Epiusios is translated as supersubstantialum in the Vulgate Matthew chapter 6 verse 11 and accordingly as supersubstantial in the Douay Reims Bible Matthew chapter 6 verse 11. Barclay M. Newman's A Concise Greek-English Dictionary of the New Testament, published in a revised edition in 2010 by the United Bible Societies has the following entry. Epiusios on I me of doubtful meaning, for today, for the coming day, necessary for existence it thus derives the word from the preposition epi, epi and the verb I me, I me from the latter of which are derived words such as ausia, ousia, the range of whose meanings is indicated in a Greek-English lexicon. Topic. 
Topic: Fifth Petition. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. The Presbyterian and other Reformed churches tend to use the rendering, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Anglicans and Methodists are more likely to say, Trespasses, those who trespass against us. The debts form appears in the first English translation of the Bible, by John Wycliffe in 1395, Wycliffe spelling, debtes. The trespasses version appears in the 1526 translation by William Tyndale, Tyndale spelling, triaspaces. In 1549 the first book of common prayer in English used a version of the prayer with, trespasses. This became the, official, Version used in Anglican congregations. On the other hand, the 1611 King James Version, the version specifically authorized for the Church of England, has, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. After the request for bread, Matthew and Luke diverge slightly. Matthew continues with a request for debts to be forgiven in the same manner as people have forgiven those who have debts against them. Luke, on the other hand, makes a similar request about sins being forgiven in the manner of debts being forgiven between people. The word, debts, a philomata does not necessarily mean financial obligations, as shown by the use of the verbal form of the same word ophiolite in passages such as Romans chapter 13 verse 8. The Aramaic word hoba can mean, debt, or sin. This difference between Luke's and Matthew's wording could be explained by the original form of the prayer having been in Aramaic. The generally accepted interpretation is thus that the request is for forgiveness of sin, not of supposed loans granted by God. Asking for forgiveness from God was a staple of Jewish prayers. It was also considered proper for individuals to be forgiving of others, so the sentiment expressed in the prayer would have been a common one of the time. Anthony C. Dean, canon of Worcester Cathedral, suggested that the choice of the word aphilomata, debts, rather than hamatias, sins, indicates a reference to failures to use opportunities of doing good. He linked this with the parable of the sheep and the goats also in Matthew's Gospel, in which the grounds for condemnation are not wrongdoing in the ordinary sense, but failure to do right, missing opportunities for showing love to others, Matt. 25-31-46. As we forgive. Divergence between Matthew's. Debts. And Luke's. Sins is relatively trivial compared to the impact of the second half of this statement. The verses immediately following the Lord's Prayer, Matt. 6.14-15 show Jesus teaching that the forgiveness of our sin, debt by God is linked with how we forgive others, as in the parable of the unforgiving servant, Matt. 18.23-35, which Matthew gives later. R. T. France comments, the point is not so much that forgiving is a prior condition of being forgiven, but that forgiving cannot be a one-way process. Like all God's gifts it brings responsibility, it must be passed on. To ask for forgiveness on any other basis is hypocrisy. There can be question, of course, of our forgiving being in proportion to what we are forgiven, as 1823-35 makes clear. Topic. Sixth petition And lead us not into temptation Interpretations of the penultimate petition of the prayer Not to be led by God into pirismos Very considerably The range of meanings of the Greek word Pirismos Pirismos is illustrated in New Testament Greek lexicons in different contexts it can mean temptation, testing, trial, experiment. Although the traditional English translation uses the word temptation, and Carl Jung saw God as actually leading people astray, Christians generally interpret the petition as not contradicting James chapter 1 verses 13 to 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. 
Some see the petition as an eschatological appeal against unfavorable last judgment, a theory supported by the use of the word pyrosmos in this sense in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Others see it as a plea against hard tests described elsewhere in Scripture, such as those of Job. It is also read as, Do not let us be led by ourselves, by others, by Satan into temptations. Since it follows shortly after a plea for daily bread i.e., material sustenance, it is also seen as referring to not being caught up in the material pleasures given. A similar phrase appears in Matthew chapter 26 verse 41 and Luke chapter 22 verse 40 in connection with the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in a translation of the Holy Bible which was not completed before his death, used and suffer us not to be led into temptation. In a conversation on the Italian TV channel TV 2000 on 6 December 2017, Pope Francis commented that the then Italian wording of this petition similar to the traditional English was a poor translation. He said, the French, i.e., the Bishops' Conference of France, had changed the petition to, do not let us fall in, into temptation. He was referring to the 2017 change to a new French version, ANE now slash par entrance and tentation. Do not let us enter into temptation. But spoke of it in terms of the Spanish translation, no nos deges caer en la tentación. Do not let us fall in, into temptation. That he was accustomed to recite in Argentina before his election as Pope. He explained. I am the one who falls, it's not him God pushing me into temptation to then see how I have fallen." Anglican theologian Ian Paul said that such a proposal was, "...stepping into a theological debate about the nature of evil." In January 2018, the German Bishops' Conference rejected any rewording of their translation of the Lord's Prayer. Topic. 2019 change in an Italian translation In November 2018, the Episcopal Conference of Italy adopted a new edition of the Messal Romano, the Italian translation of the Roman Missal, which received, a few months later, the confirmation by the Holy See that was required for publication. One of the changes made from the older 1983 edition was to render this petition as non abandonarci alla tentazione. Do not abandon us to temptation. Some news reports in English gave the false impression that the Holy See's confirmation of the choice made by the Italian bishops was instead a decree by Pope Francis changing the Our Father for the whole of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of England and Wales and the Bishops' Conference of Scotland denied this in response to a query from the British tabloid newspaper The Sun. The Italian speaking Waldensian Evangelical Church maintains its translation of the petition, Non esporci alla tentazione. Do not expose us to temptation. <laughs> Topic. Seventh petition. But deliver us from evil. Translations and scholars are divided over whether the final word here refers to evil in general or the evil one, the devil in particular. In the original Greek, as well as in the Latin translation, the word could be either of neuter, evil in general, or masculine, the evil one, gender. Matthew's version of the prayer appears in the Sermon on the Mount, in earlier parts of which the term is used to refer to general evil. Later parts of Matthew refer to the devil when discussing similar issues. However, the devil is never referred to as the evil one in any known Aramaic sources. While John Calvin accepted the vagueness of the term's meaning, he considered that there is little real difference between the two interpretations, and that therefore the question is of no real consequence. Similar phrases are found in John chapter 17 verse 15 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3. Topic. Doxology 
The doxology of the prayer is not contained in Luke's version, nor is it present in the earliest manuscripts of Matthew, representative of the Alexandrian text, although it is present in the manuscripts representative of the later Byzantine text. Most scholars do not consider it part of the original text of Matthew. New translations generally omit it, the first known use of the doxology, in a less lengthy form, for yours is the power and the glory forever. As a conclusion for the Lord's Prayer in a version slightly different from that of Matthew is in the Didache, 8-2. It has similarities with 1 Chronicles. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. In the Byzantine rite, a similar doxology is sung within the context of the divine liturgy. Following the last line of the prayer, the priest sings, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Latin Church Roman Catholics do not use the doxology when reciting the Lord's Prayer, because it is not part of their received liturgical tradition and is not found in the Latin Vulgate of St. Jerome. Since 1970 it is included in the Roman Rite Mass as an independent item, not as part of the Lord's Prayer. The Anglican Book of Common Prayer sometimes gives the Lord's Prayer with the doxology, sometimes without. Most Protestants append it to the Lord's Prayer. Topic. Use as a language comparison tool In the course of Christianization, one of the first texts to be translated between many languages has historically been the Lord's Prayer, long before the full Bible would be translated into the respective languages. Since the 16th century, collections of translations of the prayer have often been used for a quick comparison of languages. The first such collection, with 22 versions, was Midridates, De Differentes Linguarum by Conrad Gessner, 1555. The title refers to Midridates VI of Pontus who according to Pliny the Elder was an exceptional polyglot. Gessner's idea of collecting translations of the prayer was taken up by authors of the 17th century, including Hieronymus Megiserus and Georg Pistorius Thomas Ludekin in 1680 published an enlarged collection of 83 versions of the prayer, of which three were in fictional philosophical languages. Ludican quotes as a Barnum Hagius as his source for the exotic scripts used, while the true anonymous author was Andreas Müller. In 1700, Ludican's collection was re-edited by B. Mottis as Oratio Dominica plus Centum Linguis Virginibus Aut Characteribus Reddita A. Expressa. This edition was comparatively inferior, but a second, revised edition was published in 1715 by John Chamberlain. This 1715 edition was used by Gottfried Hensel in his Synopsis Universa Philologiae, 1741, to compile geographico polyglot maps, where the beginning of the prayer was shown in the geographical area where the respective languages were spoken. Johann Ulrich Krauss also published a collection with more than 100 entries. These collections continued to be improved and expanded well into the 19th century. Johann Christoph Adelung and Johann Severin Vater in 1806 to 1817 published the prayer in well nigh 500 languages and dialects. Samples of scripture, including the Lord's Prayer, were published in 52 Oriental languages, most of them not previously found in such collections, translated by the Brethren of the Sarampore Mission and printed at the Mission Press there in 1818. Relation to Jewish prayer There are similarities between the Lord's Prayer and both biblical and post-biblical material in Jewish prayer especially Kiddushan 81a Babylonian, Our Father which art in heaven, Avinu Shabashamayim, is the beginning of many Hebrew prayers, Hallowed be thy name, is reflected in the Kaddish, Let us not into sin, 
is echoed in the morning blessings of Jewish prayer. A blessing said by some Jewish communities after the evening Shema includes a phrase quite similar to the opening of the Lord's Prayer. Our God in heaven, hallow thy name, and establish thy kingdom forever, and rule over us forever and ever. Amen. There are parallels also in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verses 10 to 18. Rabbi Aaron Mendez Chumacero has said that nearly all the elements of the prayer have counterparts in the Jewish Bible and Deuterocanonical books. The first part in Isaiah chapter 63 verses 15 to 16. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and beautiful habitation. For you are our father and Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 23. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. And Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 23. I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. The second part in Obadiah chapter 1 verse 21. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 18. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. The third part in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 8. Feed me with my apportioned bread. The fourth part in Sirach 28-2. Forgive your neighbor the wrong he has done, and then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. Deliver us from evil. Can be compared with Psalm chapter 119 verse 133. Let no iniquity get dominion over me. Chumacero says that, because the idea of God leading a human into temptation contradicts the righteousness and love of God. Led us not into temptation, has no counterpart in the Jewish Bible, Christian Old Testament. The word, pirismos, which is translated as temptation, could also be translated as test or trial, making evident the attitude of someone's heart. Well known examples in the Old Testament are God's test of Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, his moving. The Hebrew word means basically, to prick, as by weeds, thorns. David to do, numbering Israel, what David later acknowledged as sin, 2 Samuel chapter 24 verses 1 to 10, see also 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verses 1 to 7, and the testing of Job in the book of Job. Topic. Musical settings. In modern times, various composers have incorporated the Lord's Prayer into a musical setting for utilization during liturgical services for a variety of religious traditions as well as interfaith ceremonies. Included among them are 9th-10th century, Gregorian chant 1878, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, Oce Nash, Oce Nas Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, Op. 41 1883, Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, Oce Nash. 1906, Leos Janathek, Oce Nors. 1919, Emil von Reznicek, Vater Unser im Himmel, a choral fantasy with mixed chorus and organ. 1910, Sergei Rachmaninoff, Oce Nash, Oce Nars Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, Op. 31. 1926, Igor Stravinsky, Oce Nash, 1926, arranged by Peter Noster, Latin, some time later. 1935, Albert Hay Mallet, The Lord's Prayer. 1973, Arnold Strauss, The Lord's Prayer, performed by Sister Janet Mead. 1985, Clive Strutt, 13 Paternoster in the Festal Eucharist in honor of Saint Olaf, King and Martyr. 1992, John Serry Sr. The Lord's Prayer for Organ and Chorus 1999, Paul Field and Stephen Deal, The Millennium Prayer, performed by Cliff Richard, 2000, John Taverner, The Lord's Prayer, 2004, Lisa Gerard, Abwoon, Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. 
Topic: In popular culture As with other prayers, the Lord's Prayer was used by cooks to time their recipes before the spread of clocks. For example, a step could be, Simmer the broth for three Lord's Prayers. American songwriter and arranger Brian Wilson set the text of the Lord's Prayer to an elaborate close harmony arrangement loosely based on Mallet's melody. Wilson's group, the Beach Boys, would return to the piece several times throughout their recording career, most notably as the B-side to their 1964 single, Little Saint Nick. The band Yazoo used the prayer interspersed with the lyrics of, In My Room. On the album Upstairs at Eric's, the 2005 game Civilization IV uses a Swahili language version of the prayer as its main theme. Topic. Images Topic. See also Amen Didash, an early book of rituals which mentions saying the prayer three times daily Discourse on ostentation, a portion of the Sermon on the Mount Five Discourses of Matthew Hail Mary High Priestly Prayer Prayer in the New Testament Novum Testamentum Grace, the primary source for most contemporary New Testament translations Rosary Textus Receptus Church of the Pater Noster on the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem Al-Fatiha